Chapter Thirteen, Reynolds and the Eighteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Art for Young People by Agnes Ethel Conway and Sir Martin Conway. The painting discussed in this chapter is the Duke of Gloucester, by Sir Joshua Reynolds. Chapter Thirteen, Reynolds and the Eighteenth Century. Hitherto we have travelled far and wide in our search for typical examples of the beautiful in painting. We went from Flanders to Italy, from Italy to Germany, back to Holland, and thence to Spain. It is true that we began in England with our first picture, and that we have returned twice, once with Holbein and again with Van Dyck, both foreign-born and trained artists. We will finish with examples of truly native English art. In the eighteenth century, England, for the first time, gained a foremost place in painting, though the people of the day scarcely realized that it was so. Even the poet Gray. Writing in seventeen sixty three, could say, Why this nation has made no advance hitherto in painting and sculpture, it is hard to say. You are generous enough to wish, and sanguine enough to foresee, that art shall one day flourish in England. I too much wish, but can hardly extend my hopes so far. Yet in seventeen sixty three, Reynolds was forty years of age. And Gainsborough, but four years younger. Hogarth was even sixty six, and at work upon his last plate. Although hitherto the best painting in England had been done by foreign artists, such as Holbein and Van Dyck, yet there had always been Englishmen of praiseworthy talent who had painted pleasing portraits. Hogarth carried this native tradition to a high point of excellence. He painted plain, good natured looking people in an unaffected and straightforward way. But he was a humorist in paint, and as great a student of human nature as he was of art. His insight into character and his great skill with the brush, combined with his sensitiveness to fun, make him in certain respects a unique painter. In the National Gallery there is a picture of the heads of his six servants in a double row. They might all be characters from Dickens, so vividly and sympathetically humorous is each. In his engravings, Hogarth satirized the lives of all classes of the society of his day. When we look at them, we live again in eighteenth century London and walk in streets known to fame, though now destroyed. Thronged with men and women true to life. As an artist, Hogarth occupies a position between the seventeenth century Dutch painters of low life and the English painters that succeeded him, who expressed the ideals of a refined society. His portraits have something of the strength of Rembrandt's. His street and tavern scenes rival Jan Steen's, but behind the mere representation of brutality, Vice, crime, and misery, we perceive not merely a skilled craftsman, but a moral being, whom contact with misery deeply stirs, and the sight of wickedness moves to indignation. After seventeen twenty, a succession of distinguished painters were born in England. Many of them first saw the light in obscure villages in the depths of the country. Reynolds came from Devonshire, Gainsborough from Suffolk. Romney from the Lake Country. The eighteenth century was a time when politicians and men of letters had the habit of gathering in the coffee houses of London, forerunners of the clubs of today. Conversation was valued as one of life's best enjoyments, and the varied society of actors, authors, and politicians, in which it flourished best, could only be obtained in the town. To the most distinguished circle of that kind in London, our painter Reynolds belonged. In the eighteenth century, society had also begun to divide its time in modern fashion between town and country. 
Many of the large country houses of today and nearly all the landscape gardened parks belong to that date. Nevertheless, it was a time of great artificiality of life. The ladies had no short country skirts and none of the freedom to which we are accustomed. In London they wore long powdered curls and rouged, and in the country, too, they did not escape from the artificiality of fashion. Indeed, their great desire seems to have been to get away from everything natural and spontaneous. The artificial poetry of that time deals with the patch boxes and powder puffs of the fashionable dames of the town, and with nymphs and Dresden china shepherdesses in the country. Even on Reynolds' canvases, the desire to improve upon nature is apparent. In his young days, he painted the local personages of Devonshire. Then he made a journey abroad and spent three years in Rome and Venice. On his return, he settled in London, and the most distinguished men and women of the day and their children sat to him. It seems that he would have liked his lords and ladies to look as heroic or sublime as the heroes or gods of Michelangelo. Instead of painting them in the surroundings that belonged to them, as Holbein or Velasquez would have done, he dressed his ladies in what he called white drapery, a voluminous material, neither silk, satin, woolen, nor cotton, and painted them sailing through the woods. The ladies themselves liked to look like nymphs, characterless and pretty, so the fashion of painting portraits in this way became common. The pictures are pleasing to look at, although so artificial, and after all it was only full-length portraits of ladies that Reynolds treated in this way. They were a small part of his whole output. But he and Velasquez worked in a totally different spirit. Velasquez made the subject before him, however unpromising, striking because of its truth. Reynolds liked to change it on occasion into something quite different, for the sake of making a picture pretty. Nevertheless, his strength lay in straightforward portraiture, and in the rendering of character. His portraits of men, unlike those of women, are dignified, simple, and restrained. His art was one long development till blindness prevented him from working. Every year he attained more freedom and naturalness in his pose, and developed more power in his use of color. Many would say that his loveliest achievements were portraits of children, yet he did not attain the same freedom in his child poses till late in life. You have all seen photographs, at any rate, of the Age of Innocence and the Heads of Angels, but this little picture of the Duke of Gloucester nephew of George the Third, will not be so familiar. I wonder whether it reminds you of anything you know. It reminds me of Van Dyck. The little duke stands with an air of importance upon the hillside, which is raised above the eye of the spectator, as Velasquez raised the ground beneath the pony of Don Balthazar Carlos. There is no mistake about the child being a simple English boy, with a nice chubby face and ordinary straight fair hair. But he is a prince, and knows it. For the sake of having his picture painted, he poses with an air of conscious dignity beyond his ears. He sweeps his cloak around him like any grown-up cavalier, and holds out a plumed hat and walking-stick in a lordly fashion. The child is consciously acting the part of a grown-up person, which only emphasizes his childhood. But the air of refinement and distinction in the picture comes straight from Van Dyck. As you look at the portraits of the Duke of Gloucester and William the Second of Orange, side by side, it may puzzle you to say which is the more attractive. Van Dyck has painted the clothes in more detail. A century later Reynolds has learnt to paint with dash, though not with the mastery of Velasquez. The effect of the cloak of the little duke, its shimmering shades of mauve and pink, is inimitable. It tones beautifully with the background, varying from dull green to brightest yellow. The background happens to be sky, but it might as well have been a curtain, 
as long as its bit of colour so set off the clothes of the little duke. When Reynolds painted children, he delighted in making them act parts. Even in the Age of Innocence, the little girl is looking how very, very innocent. He painted one picture of a small boy, Master Crew, dressed to look like Henry the Eighth in the style of Holbein. With broad shoulders and a rich dress, he stands on his sturdy legs quite the figure of Henry. But the face is one beam of boyish laughter, and on the top of the little replica of the body of the corpulent monarch, the effect of the childish face is most entertaining. When Reynolds puts away his ideas of the grand style of Michelangelo to paint pictures such as these, he is entirely delightful. He sometimes painted holy families and classical subjects, but the more the spirit of medieval sacred art has sunk into us, the less we can admire modern versions of the old subjects. The sacred paintings of the Middle Ages owe some of their charm to the fact that they do not make upon us the impression of life. In Reynolds' holy families, the mother and child are painted with all the skill of a modern artist, and look as human as his portraits of the Duchess of Devonshire and her baby. It is no longer possible to think of them as anything but portraits of the models whom Reynolds employed for his picture. Another method that modern artists have sometimes adopted in painting sacred subjects is to imitate the faulty drawing and incomplete representation of life which are present in the art of the old masters. But this conscious imitation of bygone ignorance beguiles no one who has once felt the charm of the painters before Raphael. Reynolds' great contemporary, Gainsborough, has been called a child of nature. He would have liked to live in the country always, and paint landscapes. He did paint many of his native Suffolk, but in his day landscapes were unsaleable, so he was driven to the town, and to portrait painting, to make a living. Less than Reynolds, a painter of character, Gainsborough reproduced the superficial expression of his sitters. But he had so natural an eye for grace and beauty, that his portraits always please. He did not attempt Reynolds' wide range of subjects, or the same difficulties of pose. Of Reynolds, he said, how various he is! But his admiration did not make him stray from his natural path to attempt the variety of another. Reynolds, equally admiring, said of him, I cannot make out how he produces his effects. Perhaps Gainsborough did not know either. He does seem to paint by instinct, and successive pictures become more pleasing. Buoyant in his life as in his art, his last words were, we are all going to heaven, and Van Dyck is of the company. Another great contemporary painter was Romney, whose portraits of ladies are delightful. Figured as nymphs, too, they are so buoyant, with bright expressions and wayward locks, that one wishes he had depicted in their faces a soul. All over England and Scotland, portrait painters flourished at this time, there were so many English artists that in 1768 the Royal Academy was founded, with Sir Joshua Reynolds as its first president. It was to the students of the Royal Academy that he delivered his discourses upon art, setting forth the principles which he judged to be sound. He was an indefatigably hard worker, until within two years of his death in 1792. All classes of men esteemed and regretted him, clouded though his intercourse with them had been by the deafness from which he suffered during the greater part of his life. Goldsmith, the author of The Vicar of Wakefield, wrote this character epitaph for him. Here Reynolds is laid, and to tell you my mind, he has not left a wiser or better behind. His pencil was striking, resistless and grand, his manners were gentle, complying, and bland. Still born to improve us in every part, his pencil our faces, his manners our heart. To coxcombs of verse, yet most civilly steering, when they judged without skill, he was still hard of hearing. 
when they talked of their Raphaels, Correggios, and stuff, he shifted his trumpet and only took snuff. By flattery unspoiled. The end is missing, for while Goldsmith was versifying so feelingly about his friend, death overtook the writer eighteen years before the subject of the epitaph. End of chapter thirteen. Read by Kara Schallenberg on July twenty fourth, two thousand eight, in San Diego, California.